Thank you for coming to my session. My name is Phil Gilmore and I'm going to talk to you about how to write programs in Python, specifically video games. Here's a list of the things you'll need to make your own games in Python. If you're following along in this class, you don't need all the graphics and sound software because I've already created the sounds, graphics, and maps for the Gobbler game. You'll only need Python, Pygame, and Visual Studio Code with the Python plugin. All the games for Kids Code Camp are available on GitHub under the user NewNug. Here's the URL for it. For instruction support and to discuss with others, visit kidscodecamp.org. So what's it like to actually program in Python? Some of the classes you'll see at Kids Code Camp are graphical programming environments such as Scratch. They let you use a mouse to drag and drop actions onto a program space instead of making you type all the commands into an editor. This is an easy way to learn and fun to work with, but very few programming languages work that way. Most are textual and require you to type out the commands you want to, the programs to run. This is a much more powerful and flexible way to write programs. Python is a textual programming language, which is why we'll use a text editor. On the left is an example of a graphical programming language. That's a picture of a program written with App Inventor. The one on the right is a picture of a textual program written in Python. Python is an interpreted language for the most part. That means it runs a little slower than some languages and it does not have a compiler that can tell you if you typed in something wrong. But it's fast enough to use for video games because the Pygame library that we'll use for graphics is written in the C language, not Python, and so it's very, very fast. Graphics are usually the slowest part of a video game. Python can be used to run program scripts, or it can be used in interactive mode. In interactive mode, it provides a REPL. That means read, evaluate, print, loop. You can enter commands, it will execute them immediately and show you the result. It's an easy way to test Python behaviors. I'll show you some of this in a moment. Just remember to use Control Z or type quit with open and close parentheses to quit the Python console. Now let's talk about some programming concepts. The first thing you do when you learn a new programming language is learn how to read the keyboard and write to the screen. This allows you to debug your programs as you learn and your programs become larger. It's a tradition that your first programming exercise is to write a program that outputs the words hello world to the screen. Screen output is easy in Python. You just write print with open and close parentheses and inside the parentheses you write the data you want to display. You might think the print function would send a command to the inkjet printer and write text on paper, but it doesn't you will send the command to be displayed to your monitor screen. If you want to type the exact words you want shown, you put it inside quotes. Otherwise, you probably want to type the name of a variable or function. We'll get to those. But first, let me explain what data is. Programs are made of two things, code and data. Code are actions. They're instructions that you give the computer to tell it what to do. Data is information or knowledge. Code will perform operations on your data. In this case, print is code, and hello world is data. Although we don't use it much for our games, you can see the syntax for reading user input from the keyboard here using the input function. We'll explain the parts of that line as we go rather than getting into it here. Let's talk about case sensitivity and syntax. Python is a case sensitive language. So uppercase and lowercase matter as you're typing in Python. Almost everything you type is in all lowercase, so if you put in the wrong one, an uppercase letter where it shouldn't be, you're going to get an error. You need to pay very careful attention to that. Classes, which we'll talk about later, do start with uppercase letters for each word, as in the example. Names which are all lowercase should use an underscore between words, as in this example. Variables store data for you. Variables are very important in any programming language. They're like a little storage unit at the self-storage yard. You can put anything in them. You don't have to remember what's in them. They'll just hold it for you until you want to get that thing out of them again. They don't have a number like a storage unit, but they have a name, and it does the same thing. You use it to find that storage unit again later. You make up any name you like. You just have to remember the name that you gave it, and you can get your data out again. The data will stay in the variable until you put some other data into the variable instead. You can put data into a variable using the equals sign. This is called the assignment operator. You can read the data value by just typing the variable name in the place where you want the data value to be. So in the example, the first line assigns 5 to the variable whose name is A. 
then A contains a 5. To use that 5 and add it with 2, just type A instead of 5, and the 5 will come out of the A variable and become 5 when that part of the program runs. I promised to show you the interactive console and the REPL, and this is a good time to do that. So on Windows, I'm going to click the Start button and type CMD and press Enter. and that will bring up my command window. If you're using a Mac, you can press Command Space, and that will open Spotlight. Then you can type Terminal, and press Enter, and it will open up a terminal window. You may also find a shortcut elsewhere that's more convenient if you like. If you're running Windows, here in the command prompt, you can type Python, and press Enter. If you're running on a Mac, you'll want to, press, you'll want to type Python 3, and press Enter. You should end up in the same place. It should look almost the same. You'll have a triple chevron prompt there. That means that it's waiting for me to issue Python commands, and I can issue any Python command here. Because it's a REPL, the E stands for evaluate and the P stands for print, it will take any value I put in here and evaluate it and then display the result. So if I type 5 and press enter, it will evaluate it and determine that the result is 5. Not very sophisticated, but it can get more sophisticated. If I were to say 5 plus 2, it will evaluate the arithmetic and show me the value 7. Now, in the example of the slide in the background, we used this expression, a equals 5. This assignment operator will put the value of 5 into the variable a, and the result is nothing. But if I type a, it will evaluate the variable a, it will find that there's a value of 5 inside of it, and it will display that value to me. Furthermore, I could make this even more sophisticated and say a plus 2. It will take the 5 out of the a, add 2 to it, and the result will be 7. And this can get ever more complicated as you need, but because the REPL is so easy to use, it's a convenient place for you to experiment and learn when you to use Python. When you're done, you can just type quit with open and close parentheses and press enter. It will return you to your system command prompt and in either Windows or Mac you can just type exit and press enter to terminate this command window. There are different types of data. That's a special word I used there, type. Some data are whole numbers, and their type is called integers. Computers like to work with integers and are very fast when doing math with integers. Some numbers are decimal numbers. Programmers and mathematicians have many names for decimal numbers. In Python, this type is called a float. Text is a type called a string. Strings are made of single letters called chars. However, the computer's alphabet has many more letters than our 26-letter alphabet. The computer alphabet contains upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and symbols. They can all be part of the text in a string. These types are simple types. We call them primitive types. There are more complex types which we'll discuss later. Data in one type can't always be mixed with data of another type. For example, you can't add a string to an integer because a string isn't a number and the laws of mathematics only apply to numbers. Here's one of the complex types I mentioned. A list is a variable whose type is list. It can hold multiple pieces of data of any type. Instead of having three integer variables to hold three numbers, you can have one list variable to hold three numbers. A list can be stored in a variable just like primitive data types can. But to hold multiple data values, it needs an index for each one. So instead of a variable being like a single storage unit, a list is like a whole row of storage units and each door has its own number on it. That's how you tell it where to put the values and how to tell it which ones to retrieve from it. A list is also an object. We'll talk more about objects later, but for now you'll notice that it means that my example shows things like dot append and dot extend. These are called methods, and they're code that works only with that list and no other. You'll understand them later, but for now you can just follow the examples to make them do what you want. Like the slide here says, you can use them like a briefcase. You can control the order of the items you put in there. You can add more, remove them, count them, and carry them with you wherever you go if you put them into a variable. The most important thing you need to remember about lists, though, is that computers always count from zero. So there are 12 eggs in a carton. If I asked you to count them, you would say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 
there were 12 eggs and you said 12 numbers as you counted. But if I ask the computer to count them, it will also have a number for each one and there will still be 12 of those numbers. But it will say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So if you want to tell a list which index you want to use, you must remember that the index will be one less than the number that a human counts with. Computers always start counting at zero. Tuples look a lot like lists, and they really are. However, you use tuples for different things. Remember that I said a list was like a briefcase. It gives you a lot of control over the order of what you put in and take out of it. A tuple is more like a purse or a bag. It's a container that doesn't really have any order to the things inside it. They're just a pile at the bottom. To get something out of it, you have to dump the contents of the entire thing onto a table, and then you have access to everything that was in it, whether you wanted them all or not. Sometimes this is just what you want. You see that list literals are typed out as a list of values starting and ending with square brackets. Tuples are a list of values starting and ending with parentheses. We use tuples a lot in games to store screen coordinates. To get the values out of a tuple, you use a deconstruction. The example shows two variables being assigned to the coordinates tuple, and they will receive the values that it contains. The coordinates tuple contains two values, so a deconstruction requires me to use two variables to match. I'm naming these variables x and y, which is why we always use the which is what we always use for coordinates when working with graphics. Operators is what we call the symbols we use in math operations. You surely already know the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division operations. We use the plus, minus, star or asterisk, and slash characters for these math operations, and we call them arithmetic operators. The ones on the, on the right side of this screen are called comparison operators. They have a value on each side of them, and they are used to check if two values are equal, less, or greater than. The result is a Boolean value. We'll talk about Booleans next. So one day, about 150 years ago, a guy named George Boole took what we all know and understand about logical truth and thought he should write it down. The next thing you know, he's famous, and they name a whole new branch of mathematics after him. It's not really even math, not as most people understand it. It seems silly and obvious, but it's very important in computer programming. So let me explain what Boolean logic is. Boolean is another data type. It can only have one of two values, true or false. A Boolean true or false value coupled with one of the special Boolean logical operators is like a math equation. Instead of saying 5 plus 7, we might say true plus true, but plus isn't one of the special Boolean operators. The Boolean operators are AND, OR, and NOT. So instead we say true or false, or true and true. The result of these so-called math problems is another true or false Boolean value. So what do these Boolean expressions mean? Well, there's a truth table that you could use to look up what the results would be for a given Boolean value pair and an operator. But we don't even need the truth table. You already understand how these work if you think about it. If I tell you two true things and use the right AND or OR words, you know the answer already. For example, if I say, there's a COVID pandemic right now, which is true, and the year is 2020, which is also true then the overall sentence is a true statement. I could say, ice is hot, or summer is hot. That is also a true statement because I used the word or. Either the first statement is true, or the second statement is true, so the overall statement is true. On this slide, I'm showing the truth table for the AND operator. On this slide, I'm showing the truth table for the OR operator. So I think this co concept is pretty obvious and you probably understand it at this point, so let's move on. In our code, sometimes it's necessary to tell a program that several commands or statements are part of a group. These groups are called code blocks. Many languages do this in different ways, but Python is rather special about this. When writing programs, we use spaces and tabs to arrange the code in ways that make it more readable. Readability is absolutely huge in computer programming. To give us this freedom, most languages will ignore your spacing, and it doesn't make a difference in your program. But in Python, it's different. You have to use perfect spacing, or your program won't work. You use a colon, which is the one with two dots, 
to tell Python that you're using a code block, then you use indentation to tell it which lines are in that code block. Your indentation on each line must always be made of the same spaces and tabs as every other line. The easiest way to avoid problems with this is by using the tab key for your indentations. Comments are lines that Python will ignore. That way you can write notes to yourself inside your program. To make Python ignore a line, add a hash symbol. Everything after the hash will be ignored. Anything on the line before the hash will be part of your program. Yes, I said hash. This is not a hashtag. It is a hash. You can call it a pound sign if you want. Both are fine. The word hashtag comes from Twitter, where a tag word is preceded by the hash symbol, making the whole thing a hashtag. The symbol by itself, even though people verbalize it as hashtag, is just called a hash. None of this has anything to do with Python or programming video games, but now you know. Each instruction that we write in our program generally does just one thing, whatever that thing may be. Sometimes we have a set of instructions or commands that we want to execute in the same way over and over again. It doesn't make sense to type them out over and over. It takes more work to write it repeatedly, it takes more work to change it later, and if we make a mistake we have to fix it in more than one place. It's also hard to read a long list of commands and understand what they're doing. We have to pay close attention to it and study and to see the big picture. We can solve these problems by putting this set of commands into an imaginary box called a function. The function has a name, and whatever we, whenever we want to use the commands inside it, we just call the function's name and it will perform for us. Here's an example. How do we brush our teeth? You see the list of tasks on the screen? It's actually quite involved when you break it down like that. But when your mother reminds you to do this, does she issue each of these individual instructions to you every night? Of course not. Instead, she just says, brush your teeth. And you know all the steps involved to get the job done because you've been told before. And the procedure for brushing your teeth has been something that has already been established for you, and it doesn't change. When you want to use a function and have it execute the commands in its box, we type its name and then the open and close parentheses, like in this example. Sometimes we put things inside the parentheses. This is because sometimes the function has questions about how to do its job. It'll need you to give it some extras to satisfy its questions. Have you ever had to tell your mom you were out of toothpaste? Toothpaste is what's called a dependency. You can't brush your teeth without it, even though you know how to brush your teeth. To handle dependencies, a function can be written so that it uses parameters. Parameters go between the parentheses. Parameters get names, and inside the function, they become variables for you to use. Look at the image on this slide. If you need toothpaste and a toothbrush to use your brush your teeth function, think of the parentheses as handles on a basket that contains all the things your function needs. The code that invokes the function must put the dependencies in the basket for the function to use, and then passes the basket to the function with all these goodies inside it. The function then can then use anything that's in the basket. This is how the brush your teeth function looks in Python when using parameters. It starts with the def keyword, then has a name followed by parameters. The remaining lines contain code inside a code block to execute when the function is used. When a function is used, we say that it is called or invoked. Functions can execute multiple instructions with a single call, but they can also send back a data value. Functions are a concept borrowed from algebra, and this is a little bit like the way they work in algebra. They take parameters, perform an action on them, and then at the end the function represents a new value. We use the return instruction to tell Python what data value is passed back. Now here's where it gets tricky. A function now works like a literal or like a variable. Anywhere you type it, it will represent a data value. That means it can be passed as a parameter to another function, or it can be stored in a variable just like any other data value can. In this example, we pass the function result directly as a parameter to the print function. We talked about code blocks a few times now. What I described before as the stuff we put into a box is called the function body. The function body is written as a code block. When the code block ends, Python knows that the function's code ends there and everything after that is not in the function's body. Here's what a function looks like with some code before it and some code after it. 
Python supports object-oriented programming. Objects are another one of the types which we call a complex type. Remember that I said functions were just a box which contained smaller code functions? Objects are an even bigger box and they can contain functions. They can also contain variables. A class has a name just like a function, but using classes is a little different than functions. Classes can extend smaller classes to create fancier classes. This is called inheritance. A class is a blueprint for building objects in its own image. Classes have special rules, and Pygame uses them to make sprites. A class is like a blueprint. You could use a house class to build a house object. Or you could use it to build ten house objects. Since all of the houses came from the same blueprint, all the houses will be exactly the same. However, they will all have their own addresses and their own family living in them. After they're built, you can change their data, like painting a wall or planting some trees. So now each house can be slightly different, but they all have the same architecture. A powerful part of classes is that they can add on to other classes. For example, if you have a standard house blueprint, you can make a bigger house blueprint by taking what's in the standard house blueprint and adding on a garage and a patio. But because the standard house blueprint includes the kitchen, bedroom, and bathroom, you don't have to do those parts all over again for the bigger house. You just reuse those parts from the standard house blueprint. So an object gets all the properties of all the classes that were used to create it. Classes inherit other classes to extend their functionality. Once you have a class, you can create objects from it by invoking it by name with parentheses, just like a function. This invokes a special function called init, or sometimes called dunder init, and that function may require you to pass parameters to it when creating objects. In other languages, the init function would be called a constructor, but Python doesn't call it that. Sprites are images that have irregular shapes. That means any shape that is not a plain rectangle. Many years ago, sprites were very hard for video games to do. They require a lot of calculation to draw them. Today's computers are very fast and sprites are now very easy. All we have to do these days is use PNG graphics files which contain transparent areas that won't be drawn. Pygame has a sprite class. You can write classes that inherit the sprite class to create your own sprites. In this way you can use the sprite classes for more than just the graphics. It can control its own location on screen, its own behaviors, animations, and sounds all in one class. Not all graphics have to be sprites. It may be hard to visualize what a sprite is. Here I have a picture of a race car. The outline of the car is not really understood by the program. All images in a computer are rectangular. The car itself has a curvy shape, but the image that contains the car is still a rectangle. The background of the car image is just as much a part of the image as the car is. So when I want to draw the image onto a racetrack in my game, it will look like this. That black background covers up the racetrack that we really wanted to use for the background. A sprite is an image that can be drawn with a transparent area to eliminate the background that doesn't belong in our game. If this car was a sprite instead of a regular image, the black background would be transparent, revealing the racetrack which is drawn behind it. And it would look like this instead. To make your game graphics work this way, draw your images with a transparent background and then save them as a PNG file in paint.net. A program that never makes decisions during its execution will always do the exact same thing and is a very boring program. To make an interactive program that responds to user input, we will have to make decisions based on data. We do this with the if statement. We give it a Boolean expression and then a code block. If the expression is a true statement, then Python will execute the code block for us. If we want to, we can give it a second code block that starts with an else keyword. When the expression is a false statement, Python will execute the else code block instead. We can also add multiple Boolean expressions, which each with their own code block. In a video game, we use if blocks a lot when deciding whether the user pressed a button or a keyboard on the keyboard or on the mouse. One thing computers do very well is repetitive tasks. We can make a program repeat a task using a for loop. If we have a list, we can write a code block that will execute once for each element in the list. And every time it runs, Python will put one of the elements from the list into a variable for the code block to use. We tell it which variable we want Python to put the value into when we write the for statement. In this example, 
The first time Python runs the code block which contains print name, it will be given the first element from the name list. It puts the value philip into the name variable for the code block, and then the code block can use the name variable to do whatever it needs to do with it. When the code block ends, the for loop starts again and puts the second element into the name variable and runs the code block again. This will repeat until the last element in the list is processed and the code block ends. The output for this example is shown below. It displayed the names from the name list or from the list one at a time onto the screen. Looping with lists is kind of a new way to do looping. Most programming languages support another, older way of looping. The classic for loop doesn't repeat for elements in a list. Instead, it repeats for numbers in a set. Old programming languages had a complicated way of counting numbers in a for loop, but Python makes it easy. The range function will return a list of numbers that you can repeat on. It takes one parameter, which is the number of values you want in the set. Remember that computers always start counting from zero, so in the example we pass a three, but it counts from zero to two, as you can see in the output. There's another kind of loop that's more complicated. Instead of looping through a set, a while loop waits patiently for a Boolean expression to become false. The expression is never guaranteed to ever be false, so a while loop may end up running forever. What we would call this an infinite loop. Sometimes we use a break statement inside the while loop to stop it if we have a second reason to. In video games, we create an infinite loop on purpose. We call it the game loop, and by itself it will run forever. The only way to stop it is if we have a situation where the user quits or the game is over, and then we can use the break statement to end the loop. When that happens, the execution will run to the end of the code and the program will close. If we write very useful code, we may want to use it again in other programs. This is really important to do. It allows us to make our next program in less time because part of it is already written for us. When we write code that we want to reuse, we put it into a module then the next program will reuse it by importing that module. In our game we won't be creating our own modules, but we will separate our program into several different source files. To make that work, we still use the import statements to glue them together as a program. Now that we've learned some Python programming, let's talk about how to make video games with it. Every video game follows the same basic structure. First we have some code in the beginning which sets everything up. This code runs only once. Then the rest of the program runs inside of an infinite loop we call the game loop. Inside the game loop we look for keyboard, mouse, and gamepad input. Then we have code that changes the state of our game objects, such as our sprites and our scores, then draws the graphics and plays the sounds. Sometimes we also write some timing code to keep our game from running too fast. Graphics are drawn on the screen using X and Y coordinates on a two-dimensional plane. The upper left of the screen is 0, 0, which means the x-coordinate is 0 and the y-coordinate is 0. Each pixel or dot on the screen as you move to the right has a higher x-coordinate. Each pixel on the screen as you move downward has a higher y-coordinate. This is like the Cartesian plane you learn about in algebra, except that y increases as you go down instead of increasing as you go up. This is the plane we're talking about. The green area is the visible screen. Anything outside of it is ignored. You can see that the upper left corner of the plane is xy coordinates 0, 0. This is called the origin of the plane. The lower right corner has the highest x and y values. The screen resolution determines how much of the plane is in the visible screen. In this example it says that the screen mode is 640 by 480 pixel resolution. Remember that a computer counts from 0. If the screen resolution is 640 by 480, then the lower right xy coordinates would be 6. 39 by 479. The x-axis would go from 0 to 639 and the y-axis would go from 0 to 479. A surface is a Pygame object on which you can draw graphics. They are rectangular and they can draw onto each other. They can also perform many graphics tricks when they draw. They are the most important part of graphics in Pygame. You can create many surfaces for drawing as you compose a picture to put onto the screen. However, drawing on a surface doesn't generally show anything on the screen. It's all done in the background. To make any of the graphics show up on the screen, you have to draw on a special surface that represents the monitor screen or the game window on the monitor screen. Any graphics you draw on that surface will show up on the screen, although not immediately. A rectangle is not graphics. It's just an object that stores information about a rectangle. 
It has four corners, four sides, a width, and a height. Rectangles are simple things, but remember how we talked about how graphics are always rectangular? Rectangles are very important when calculating how to draw your rectangular graphics onto surfaces. As it says on the slide, every Pi game surface has its own rectangle, and you can ask a surface to give you its rectangle by calling its getRect function. Yes, it says getRect, and yes, it is absolutely hilarious. We've covered a lot of graphics concepts here, so now I thought it would be useful to see how they can fit together to make a game. Here's a screenshot from my 2017 game Sky Fighter. You can see that the background is just a single image drawn onto the screen surface. When I draw it, I told it to stretch the image to fit the whole screen. I have a hero on the left and some angry up-to-no-gooders on the right. See their irregular shapes? That means they're drawn with transparency. And so each one is represented in the game as a class which inherits the sprite class. So that makes them sprites. The sprites are drawn onto the screen surface after the background image, so they don't get covered up. I also have a status bar at the bottom. I used a rectangular surface that I filled with a single color, and I draw it onto the screen surface next. Lastly, I draw text for the score and the remaining lives onto the screen surface. A game like Skyfire will have good guys and bad guys, and when the bad guys touch the good guy, bad things happen to him. And we have to take some action to reflect that. We have to know when sprites touch each other. This is called collision detection. It's far too slow to check every pixel of every sprite against every pixel of every other sprite in every frame 30 times per second. The game would be too slow to play, so we never do it that way. Here's a simpler way to figure it out. Sprites may have irregular shapes, but remember that this is just a drawing trick. Underneath, they are always rectangular, and they all know what their rectangle is. We can take the rectangle of two sprites and see if they overlap. If they overlap, the two sprites may be touching each other. That would be a collision. It's very easy to determine if two rectangles overlap. We just check to see if the right or left if the right or left of one rectangle is between the right and left of the other, and then do the same thing with the tops and bottoms. If either vertical edge of one rectangle is between the vertical edges of the other, and the horizontal edges of the rectangle, if either horizontal edge of the rectangle is between the horizontal edges of the other, the rectangles overlap. This is a good way to determine if the rectangles overlap, but that doesn't mean we can be sure that the actual sprite images overlap. If the overlapping regions are all just part of the transparent areas of the sprites, we really shouldn't be treated as if they were touching. Sometimes we need to de dive deeper to see if that's ha what's happening. Usually we don't have to do that, and we, don't, we won't be doing it in our games, but if you need to do that, you can first check for overlapping rectangles, and then if they do overlap, you can do a more sophisticated check, and the game can still be fast enough to play. We've been through the lesson now, so let's get on with making a game. Follow along with my second video at kidscodecamp.org as we get into some Python code and write the Gobbler game.